This is the Psychedelic Medicine Podcast. Hello and welcome to the next episode of the Psychedelic Medicine Podcast. I'm Dr. Lynn Marie Morsky, your guide on this journey, and today we are going to be discussing how psychedelics affect the brain with Manesh Gurn. Manesh is in the final stages of obtaining his PhD in neuroscience at McGill University and is an author on over a dozen peer-reviewed articles on psychedelics and related topics. He is also chief research officer at Enthia Tech Bioscience and runs a psychedelic science YouTube channel called The Psychedelic Scientist. Now, before we get to Manesh, just a reminder that the Psychedelic Medicine Podcast is for educational and informational purposes only. Nothing here is to be construed as medical or legal advice. And one last reminder, as always, if you are a clinician and you'd like to learn more about these medicines, head on over to the Psychedelic Medicine Association. Join us today. It is our mission to make sure that you are comfortable having discussion with your patients about psychedelics. The website where you can find us is psychedelicmedicineassociation.org. Now, without further ado, thanks so much for joining us today, Manesh. Yeah, it's a great pleasure to be talking to you today, Lynn Marie. This has been a long time in the coming. I, I've known Manesh on and off from conferences and over a year or so, and he recently told me, I'm, I've got a paper coming out. I want to come on and talk about when it's released, mm -hmm. and I was very excited to see that it come, it come out. The name is A Complex Systems Perspective on Psychedelic Brain Action. And for all of you out there who are like, okay, I'm already a little lost, don't worry. This, this So was I. Uh, but Manesh is mm -hmm. here to break it down because as you... If you are a fan of his YouTube channel, you know that this is his thing. He is good at breaking stuff down. And so he is going to break down for us how research is, has developed to show us how we're learning more about how psychedelics actually do affect the brain. So Manesh, can you get us started? Tell us a little bit about the background that led you all um, into writing this paper. Yes, definitely. And so we can start with the basics because if you think of the title, right, it's Complex Systems Perspective on psychedelic brain action or brain function. Um, so first, you know, on the brain function side, uh, what motivated us um, is in terms of how people have been, or researchers have been approaching how psychedelics affect the brain, they've been approaching it from a particular perspective. And this perspective asks basically, what networks are affected by psychedelics? We can keep it at that simple. And a lot of you might have heard of the default mode network. And there's a lot of stuff on the internet, basically, and Michael Pollan, et cetera, who have popularized the idea that psychedelics work by turning off or disintegrating or shutting down our default mode network. And um, the reality is, as you might guess, it's much more complex than that. And um, it was actually the evidence on relating the default mode network to things like ego dissolution and different aspects of the experience. It's not very consistent. Like the evidence is actually not very strong so far, at least. And so, um, so like, you know, a lot of the research has focused on, okay, so what networks such as the default mode network are affected by psychedelics? And um, that comes from this understanding of brain function, which says that the brain is composed of these different networks or regions. Each one does a separate thing and that certain processes or experiences can be related to a given network predominantly or like one or two networks or something like this. And so um, with this paper, we're actually pushing back against that perception or conception of how the brain works and how psychedelics affect the brain. And um, this brings the complexity uh, complexity science uh, perspective, um, part of the title. Um, what that, uh, what complexity science is, is a study of how systems of many interacting parts uh, function, basically. And um, and then, well, an example of that is um, an ecosystem. All the different animals in a given jungle all work uh, to kind of uh, together to maintain their own survival and reproduction. Like a certain Predator needs to kill um, certain prey, and then uh, that, that prey does something else, and they all play a role in the global system. Mm -hmm. And so if you were to go in and get rid of all of the tigers and have everything else same, the whole system would be in a bit of a chaos because now all the rodents that the tigers were eating are going to be proliferating, and that's going to damage the plants, and that's going to reduce plants for other animals. And you can see how, in that context, the whole ecology matters, right? And so we're applying this to the brain where we're like, you can't just look at a specific brain region or network. You got to talk about the brain as a whole in this kind of sense of seeing the brain as a system of interacting parts. 
And so, so the basic motivation for this paper was applying this kind of complexity systems level thinking to how psychedelics affect the brain as measured by um, brain imaging technology, which basically allows us to see uh, what the brain is doing while somebody's awake and under the influence of a psychedelic like psilocybin or LSD. Very cool. Don't, listeners, don't you feel smarter already? Now we all at least know what complex, hold it now, I've even forgot what, complex science, complexity yeah, science. Complexity science, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've got that concept down. So just just for some background, for the, some of the, who did some of the early work on, fi- you know, figuring out the default mode network? Right. So it originates like the whole concept of this of psychedelics and the DFMO network originated in a 2012 study done led by Robin Carhart Harris. Uh, he was then at Imperial College London and they did the first ever fMRI. Um, fMRI is like functional magnetic resonance imaging, just a way to image the brain, like I mentioned before, uh, while somebody's like under a drug while they're awake, like, you know, doing anything while awake. And they did the first ever fMRI study of psilocybin. And what was shocking was they expected the brain to be all lighting up and doing all sorts of things. But the main pattern was the brain regions that com- comprise the default mode network were deactivated. And then and in that study, they also found correlations between the default mode network and ego dissolution. So then they're like, oh, this is such an intuitive story because we know default mode network is involved in processes you know, related to our sense of self and our memories and the identity we construct. So therefore, oh, when people are having mystical experiences or ego dissolution experiences, it must be because of this. Um, so that's where it originated. And some studies since then have also found similar things, but a whole bunch have not. And so it, it, it's a very you know complex picture that's far from straightforward at the current yeah, at this moment in time. And and the reason I asked that is, be, and I I had um, guessed that it was Robin Card Harris because he is also an author on this latest paper that we're discussing today. So it's not as though like, oh, we are shooting down some other scientists. Like that's how science progresses. Is that you know one piece of work shows one thing, and then you continue to incorporate what others have found and your own lab finds, and then sometimes the hypothesis changes a little bit. Yeah, definitely. If if our perce- if our like idea of how psychedelics affect the brain is the same as it was eleven years ago, I mean something's not right there. That's not how science works. So you know, and this paper, the idea for this paper, um, I had originally brought it up with Robin, and he was really on board with it, and we discussed it a lot. And so it's really us two who you know formulate a lot of the ideas, um, and also our other co-author, and his his name's Fernando Rosas, who has a background specifically in complexity science. He also contributed a lot. Um, so yeah, definitely. I know from Robin's thinking has, has progressed a lot since that paper and obviously it's been like a decade. And so it's, it's definitely a healthy progression of the field and not us necessarily, you know, really, you know, trying to take down somebody else who believes something different. (laughs) Yeah. I love that. I just, I will take any opportunity when we can just kind of shed a little light on how science works in today's society. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I don't think it doesn't hurt to have a brush up, uh, that when, things change. It's not that the first thing was wrong. It's that the new information is incorporated. Um, mm-hmm. So when you set out to start reevaluating this, at what kinds of, like, did you run new studies or was it, or did you do a meta-analysis? What, how did you go about? For this, so there were, you could say two primary motivations for this paper. One was when I like read the literature and looked at all the brain imaging studies so far with psychedelics, um, it was pretty evident that there were a lot of things that were inconsistent. They were like general things that are very consistent, but if you get into the weeds, it was quite messy. And it's like, how do we like understand all these findings together without it being very like, we would say heterogeneous, you know, like, uh, like inconsistent, we'll just say inconsistent. (laughs) And, um, and so then it's like, okay, is there a way to create an understanding or a model that fits all this stuff together and reconciles the inconsistencies? Um, So that was half of the motivation. The other motivation was, you know, complexity science is really gaining in popularity in general these days over the last decade, two decades, um, as we're really moving away from this previous more reductionist approach to understanding things by breaking them down into their parts and looking at the simplest parts. And then in complexity, it's like, let's look at the thing as a whole and how it all integratively interacts and connects with each other. And so that's happening in a lot of different academic, you know, scientific fields. Um, and it's also being applied more and more to brain function. So we're like, okay, so how can we use that in this emerging framework of complexity science to understand uh, brain function in general? And can it potentially be the way to move forward to help unify these inconsistent findings? 
So it's those things coming together. And, um, and luckily in my immediate like network of collaborators, including Fernando, I just mentioned and, and Robin, they're all, you know, they've drinking the, the complexity science Kool-Aid, right? They're on board with these ideas. And I think really it is the way to go in a lot of cases, um, for understanding these kind of complex aspects of brain function. And so, yeah, so basically the motivation came from those two sources. All right. And then let's get into, you know, what you did and what kind of results came from it. And maybe then we can get into, you know, what questions still exist. Yeah, totally. Okay. So huh, let's see where to start with this. So um, and the, the core part of complexity uh, systems approaches to the brain is the brain is this interconnected whole. Like it's, uh, you know, one way of understanding the brain is of a whole set of different regions, which occupy, you know, different locations in the brain. And, but the thing is, all these regions are interacting. And when they interact in groups of regions that interact more with each other than the rest of the brain, we call that a network. You know, we say, you know, let's say there's 20 regions and one to five are more correlated with each other in their activity than five to six. So then one to five is a network, five to six is a network and so on. And so the brain is composed of these multiple layers where it's like regions interacting, forming networks, and then networks interacting to form the entire brain. And so then, you know, when we, under, when we look at the brain as a whole, it has certain properties, right? We can say that one of the ways in which the whole brain varies is how um, entropic it is. And what entropic it means is like how much entropy does it have? That basically means how unpredictable or chaotic is its activity over time. Um, so, you know, for example, one context where it would be not entropic is if you're, you are um, under anesthesia or you're sedated or you're in a coma. And if your brain activity is pretty consistent, if you know your activity now, you can kind of predict what it's going to be in 10 minutes because nothing's really changing. Um, and then so on the other extreme is maybe you're in a um, full on psychotic break and the world seems unstable. Your whole reality is caving in. You know, basically you feel like anything can happen at any moment. That's the other extreme. And then if you see the brain activity now, who knows where it'll be in 10 minutes or five minutes. Right. And that, that's to say it's more entropic. And so the idea is that the brain is usually at some balance point between these extremes because we don't want to be totally rigid but we don't want to be totally chaotic either. We want to have flexibility and stability kind of at the same time. And so um, there's this point uh, on that spectrum that we normally occupy. And, um, and, you know, what we would call that is there's a critical point before, right before we go into full on chaos, there's a point of like right at the middle where we're still stable enough, but we have flexibility, but we're not totally in chaos yet. And, um, and that characterizes how the brain as a whole processes, processes information. Because if we're in this place where there's flexibility, that means when we receive information from the external world, our brain doesn't process everything identically. It could process things, you know, in a bit of an adaptive way. And so, for example, if you're thrown into a new environment, we're not just in that new environment trying to do the same things we were doing in our old environment. We see what's going on around us taking that information and act in a, in a kind of adaptive and flexible way. Like we change our behavior based on the current environment and we want to be like that, right? Generally. And, um, but you don't want to be too crazy where you're just trying all sorts of random stuff in this new environment. And so one way of understanding how we're proposing how psychedelics affect the brain as a whole is it makes it shifts us a bit more to the chaotic side. Uh, and so we're, you know, a um, bit more towards the place of being of our mind and our brain being unpredictable, uh, a bit like unstable and actually more sensitive to the environment. And because when we're a bit more chaotic, when we get new information, there's so many ways we can go with it. We have more potential ways to respond just in virtue of how our brain is functioning. And so like the core idea of this paper is that psychedelics put our brain into the state that is more dynamically flexible. It's more diverse in its activity patterns, and it's more sensitive to inputs that come in. And how we would call it is sensitive to perturbations. Like the internal system is being perturbed by stuff coming from the external world through our senses. And, um, and so the idea is that it's a whole brain phenomenon. Like the, the fundamental way that our brain is processing information has been shifted. And one way this might make a lot of intuitive sense to people is the concept of set and setting, right? It's like when we take a psychedelic, we don't always get the same experience. Like, you know, 
if, for example, there was one brain state associated with a psychedelic experience, that means we're all having the same state that we're going into. But we know, you know, you take mushrooms on two different days or you give it to two different people, radically different experience, right? And it's like, why is that happening? And the way that this model explains that, for example, is that by it changes the fundamental way our brain is processing information. But what matters is what information it's receiving, whether it's from our internal experience, like our mind, our memories, our personality, you know, our past experiences, or externally, the people you're around, um, you know, uh, the, the physical environment you're in. All these things are somehow integrated into our brain in a psychedelic experience to push it in a particular direction, hence set and setting. And so, you know, bringing the framework I just described, our brain is a bit more chaotic, a bit more unpredictable, more flexible in responding to things. And therefore, the information coming in is going to have more an effect on you. And so hence set and setting. So that's one way we can use it to explain things. And um, yeah, I can keep going, but I'll stop there. <laughs> no, I mean, that's a great start because that makes total sense as to why we have very different experiences and i i'm picturing this you know kind of more more chaotic state you had described previously is like if somebody's moving towards you know a psychotic episode it gets a little more chaotic so we have to kind of wrestle with the fact that there is a uh, benefit to getting a little bit more toward that state but in a controlled environment is that fair to yeah. say hundred percent. Yeah. Controlled environment and recognizing that it's like, it's temporary, you know, you're doing it for four to six hours or, or eight to 10 with LSD. And, and this is underscores again, yeah, the importance of the context you're in because you're in a vulnerable and very suggestible state. And that, that also makes me think because a lot of the studies, as most people know, you have excluded subjects who have schizophrenia or who have a first degree relative with schizophrenia or, or a history of psychotic episodes. And I'm guessing it's because there may be the fear that uh, if a brain is, I don't know, somehow predisposed genetically or through epigenetics or whatever reason to go to a chaotic state, then the fear is that setting somebody into something that tips towards that chaotic state may kind of um, poke the hornet's nest or some some way to say that like all of a sudden the brain's like, oh, there's that chaos I was looking for and then kind of stay there. Is that part yeah. of the concern? Yeah, yeah, definitely. One interesting like analogy or like, yeah, I guess it's an analogy that comes up is um, water going from not boiling to boiling. Because like you can get to the point where it's, you know, you see the bubbles arising, it's about to boil, but you know that when it's boiling, it's in a very different state. And so like you can say, yeah, you're on the threshold of that usually, and we're going more towards the boiling state, which is chaos. And then, yeah, if, if you're predisposed to psychosis, it could be that your brain is already somewhat pushed to that side and a bit more unstable. And so when you switch into that other state, it might be harder to come back because then your brain just goes with it um, because uh, of that underlying disposition towards it, right? Yeah. And so yeah, that's definitely a, a potential way to describe that. Okay. Well, thank you for clarifying that. All right. All right. I think we're, we're with you to this point. We've got yeah. that the systems, uh, we're looking at it from the way that the systems all work together, the different networks work together. Um, but overall, all those networks seem to be a little bit more chaotic in the psychedelic state. Yes. Yeah, so what happens in a bit more detail is that um, the one aspect of this I didn't mention is that the brain becomes more uh, integrated as a whole. And um, one way of understanding that is like previously I said, a brain network is basically a set of regions that interact more with each other than they do with other regions and networks, right? And so, um, and so like statistically, we can separate them out. You can say, that's that network, that's that network, that's that network. And, um, but when you're under a psychedelic, and this is a consistent finding, majority, the majority of networks um, become less integrated with each other and more integrated um, with other networks. And so you're basically dissolving these distinct networks and blurring them all together. Another way to say it is they're becoming less differentiated from each other. And so um, the brain as a whole, the usual network organization is kind of being disrupted. And so the brain is hyper integrated. And this also relates to this whole chaotic thing. It's like usually functions that are a bit more separate from other functions are now maybe being blurred more together. And this can relate to synesthesia, for example. You know, you smell something and it, it's, you know, it smells bright purple or like, you know, you're, you hear a sound, you're like, that's definitely a green sound, <laughs> stuff like this. And that's like these usually separate aspects of our brain function being blurred together. And so at the network level, again, this corresponds to the whole brain. You can't just say, oh, the default mode network turned off, quote unquote. It never turns off, by the way. But like <laughs> the <laughs> default mode network did this, you know, uh, but it's like, OK, default network did that. 
but it's it's very connected to all sorts of other networks the visual network the what we call the frontal parietal control network or you know the salience network there's a whole bunch of networks we can characterize in the brain and they're all to some extent interacting with each other and even more in the psychedelic state so it doesn't really make sense to fully isolate one network um, at least from our perspective is that the uh, the the phenomenon you're describing with this increased interconnectivity between networks? Is that the phenomenon that was illustrated in that very famous drawing that Robin had, where you know it shows this is your brain not on drugs, and then there's not that many connections, and then there's all the connections? That is that. Yeah, what exactly. That represented that's okay. exactly what I'm referring to. Yeah, the the big circular diagram that yeah. you see in yeah everywhere these days. Yeah, totally. Yes, we'll see if Jared throws that in the show notes. I think you will. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> totally. It's an easy. It's an easy one. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. So cool. So we've got a little bit more uh, chaos going on, more interconnectivity. What else uh, did you all find? Right. So another, I think, uh, important thing about this is it helps explain the inconsistencies. Let's come back to that because I didn't describe that yet. So I, I mentioned one of the motivations was the inconsistencies, right? And the previous brain imaging findings. And so how does this explain that? And so um, it's basically, again, relates to this whole set and setting thing. It's like what psychedelics are doing is not pushing you into a particular brain state necessarily. It's changing how the brain functions. So you're able to enter into a whole variety of different states depending on set and setting, right? Which is you can understand as your brain function at the time of uh, ingesting and also during the course of effects in terms of what's happening internally and externally. And... And um, what we find in the brain imaging findings is that, you know, different studies disagree. But also, if you look at individual people, they can have radically different effects on their brain, like very like almost opposite. If you look at their uh, effects, if usually what happens in these brain imaging studies is you scan them for eight to 10 minutes and then you average the activity that occurred. And you're like, OK, what do the networks and brain regions look like on average over those 10 minutes? And um, at the level of averaging across you know, a given person's 10 minutes, then across 20 people, um, you get distinct findings across studies. But then if you look at each individual person, you find that there's huge variability there. And like two studies, which might at the average level have very different patterns, might have subjects in them that are very similar across. It's just like subsets or like smaller groups of subjects within the studies are the same. And um, yeah, I hope, I hope that's as clear. And, and, and but the thing is, like, that makes a lot of sense because we don't all have the same psychedelic experience. And we know that the brain is obviously related to our experiences that we're having. So how could we all have the same brain experience? That doesn't make any sense because, our, you know, you think of how variable and complex the psychedelic experience is over that eight minutes or 10 minutes, but also for a given person. And so this model says, says like, what determines our psychedelic experience is all these factors and how they kind of manifest in this new way that your brain is functioning. It is like temporary way that your brain is more chaotic uh, as showing more greater criticality as I, as I kind of mentioned before and you know being more sensitive to inputs and being more diverse and flexible and integrated. That shows up very differently as you would expect based on what, what materials it has to work with. And so given that, it makes a lot of sense that individuals and at the group level, there's going to be differences across people. It would be silly to expect us all to have the same pattern. It doesn't make any sense. You know? Yeah. And, and so what we're also kind of suggesting is like what we need to do is, um, well, there's two ways we can go about dealing with that. It's like one, it's like if we abstract away from the specific patterns and instead look at how regions interact overall, it's like this is what we say in the paper explicitly. It's like instead of looking for the pattern of the psychedelic experience, it's like, what are the properties of dynamic brain function that are similar across people, but manifest differently for each individual? So that's one way to say it. And, and the other way to look at it is you characterize all the states, you know, across all the people, and then find what are common patterns of states that reoccur across people. Could it, it could be like, you know, subjects or participants, one, four, and seven show this pattern, whereas two, three, five, six show this pattern. Then you're like, okay, we see that there's different patterns shared across people in their responses. Then the important part is, how does that relate to their experience? How does that relate to the positive benefits, the lasting benefits they get from it? How does it, how does it relate to the negative ones? And then you can finally start to see, it's like at an individual level, you know, how's your brain response changed or in different? And then we can, you know, that's very really, uh, clinically relevant in the end. 
So is that something that was one of the questions, like one of the theories that came out of it as something that needs to be examined further? Got it. Yes. Yes, definitely. So it's like this whole idea in psychiatry these days, I'm sure you're familiar, is a precision psychiatry. It's like, how can we personalize everything? How can we know based on their brain function, their genetics, uh, their psychological traits, you know, what, um, <clears throat> what uh, interventions, which therapies, which drugs are going to be best for our unique situation, right? And so in this case, yeah, framing it in this way, if we're able to, for example, see, you know, separate out, let's say, five different ways a person can respond to a psychedelic and then somehow relate that to, you know, how much mystical type effects, how much visual effects, how much of a, you know, how much psychological insights, how much of an emotional breakthrough did you have? You know, if you're able to relate that to these response patterns, then um, we can, you know, then develop more personalized and targeted interventions with psychedelics. It's like, and it was a paper talking about this, uh, exactly this. It's like, for example, what we would want to say is we scan your brain. Here's what your brain looks like, you know, uh, as a depressed patient. And, um, and this is your unique brain signature because not all depressed patients look the same, obviously. And it's like, given this unique expression of depression in your brain, you'll probably more benefit more uh, from ketamine than, than psilocybin or the other way around. And then we can, you know, see like, oh, like when we put the psychedelics and the ketamine into your brain, basically it shifted your brain pattern to be more like this pattern, which suggests that in three months, you probably will be better. Or it might be like, oh, in three months, you have a higher you know, probability of relapsing. So therefore, you should do this. You know, so this is the stuff we want to create. And I think the model we're proposing here informs the perspective on doing that. That's very exciting. I love the sound of that. And it reminds me to clarify, the study that you did, did that focus solely on the serotonergic psychedelics? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, we did. But it can very well apply to, I think, um, basically any drug or any cognitive process i think we can understand in this whole brain complexity way just by doing you know more like an analysis of a lot of people with fmris on those substances and the commonalities and the differences yeah and so the, the other thing here i haven't mentioned is like there are certain ways of statistically analyzing brain data that are informed by complexity science so i could talk about that but i'll get very technical really quick but it's more so like if we're not looking for distinct changes in networks, what are we looking for, right? And that, you know, introduces mathematical and statistical tools from complexity science and similar tools that have been used to characterize ecosystems or um, the stock market or weather patterns. Um, like the same kind of techniques can actually be applied to the brain when you put it in this perspective. Because at the end of the day, all these things are systems of different parts that interact in complex ways and they all share properties. And so the things that will inform this complexity perspective are using more of these complexity science measures. And entropy is one of them. That's an easy one. It's like entropy, how unpredictable or chaotic is a brain, basically. And so that's a complexity science measure. And there's a whole variety of other ways to characterize uh, how a system dynamically changes over time. And we talk about this in the paper, too. Were there any surprising findings from when you were doing the research for this paper? Hmm. Yeah, I think surprising findings. There's one, but it's, okay, I'll try to describe it. It might be technical, but <laughs> um, I asked, so we'll we'll handle it. <laughs> right. So, um, as I mentioned before, the brain naturally, like not on drugs, is at this critical point on the kind of the border of of chaos and stability or, you know, disorder and order. And the idea is that psychedelics actually move us closer to that point, a bit more close. Um, and you would expect it's like pushing us more, as I said before, kind of to the chaotic side. It's like turning the dial towards the chaos. Um, and that has been found by a couple of studies, but actually one some recent study, which was the most kind of mathematically sophisticated, you could say, actually found that the brain was more on the opposite side of this divide. It was already on the more chaotic side and it brought us back to the, the border point, which is the critical point. Um, and what's interesting here is that even though you would expect that more chaos is associated with more flexibility and all these things, but the thing is, there's a thing, uh, too much chaos, right? And so actually this like that really small point on either side of that critical line that, 
the critical point is actually where there's maximal complexity in the brain. Because for real complexity, that's not just noise, you need stability and order. You need both. You need structure. It can't just all be craziness, right? And so this one study found that the brain actually becomes less chaotic, but more closer to this critical point, which, which in some sense is saying less chaos, less noise, but more complexity. Um, so that was kind of surprising that that paper found that because we would expect more chaos. But it just speaks to like, we don't just need maximal chaos. We want complexity. And complexity is different than chaos because complexity implies structure and, uh, and more information in a sense. Um, so yeah, so that was an interesting thing, kind of technical, but yeah, that was an interesting. We thing. followed you. We followed you. I'm speaking Great. for everybody else out there. We totally, we're, we're, we're with you. Um, is there anything else that we have not covered from the paper before I ask where you plan to go next with this? Yeah. Let me think about that. Um, hmm. I think I covered most of the stuff that's worth covering. Yeah. I think it's just like, I think moving forward is generally, I think, um, it can inform new ways of, of looking at brain imaging studies, right? It can help us ask the question, you know, even though people are going to vary in their experiences and vary in the specific brain patterns, what are the more abstract general commonalities between them? And then how can we use that information again to inform therapeutic, uh, therapeutic approaches and which drug is useful for a given person and also like how the experience relates to the patterns related to a different disorder. So I think that's the, the really exciting part. And I think that's like the main, one of the main implications of the paper. Well, you have definitely opened my, the toolbox of things that I thought would be useful for precision psychedelic therapy, because I always thought like, okay, if we could do your complete medical history and family history and your um, DNA and your gut microbiome. But I did not know that if we did an, uh, an fMRI, that would provide an even more granular layer of prediction and mm-hmm. precision therefore so that's this is this is great this is yes, i mean this, this is, is the hope, yeah. yeah this is a world where you know healthcare is free or everybody's a jillionaire but so where we can import all these tests but i love just the concept that that's out there and people are looking for that so where do you manesh go from here what what's the next thing that you want to cover in your research that we can that you can tease on the show and then we'll like have you back on in a year or two <laughs> Yeah, for sure. There's a, there's a couple of things. There's a couple of things. I think one more immediate is um, what I want to do next. And this is a collaboration that I'm been discussing with Fernando, Fernando Rosas, who's at Imperial College. Uh, and um, we were thinking that, you know, right now there's a lot of ways to characterize complexity in the brain in terms of brain states, in terms of entropy, in terms of these other like very, you know, technical measures. But um, what we don't know is how they all relate to each other. And so it's like, we can obviously, if you think of a system that changes over time, there's a lot of ways to characterize that system. You know, Again, like kind of listening before, like how predictable is it? What are the different states it can enter into? Are these states, you know, do they happen multiple times? Do they, ha- do they oscillate? Do you go through states A, B, C, and then, you know, B, C, A, and then A, B, C, and then C, B, A? Is there patterns like that? Um, and also, um, something we'd want to do in the future, this is not really this project, though, is how different states might um, map onto subjective states of experiences. Um, but basically, the, the project me and Fernando are going to do is like take all these complexity measures and across a whole variety of data sets and see what the commonalities are across data sets and also how these measures relate to each other to basically ask, can we find the best measures for a particular application? Like, what are the best measures to get subjective effects? Which is the what are the best measures that might be able to find effects related to therapy, and um, you know what measures might relate to other things uh, corresponding to neuroplasticity, for example, and all this kind that's of stuff. Very cool. And so that's like yeah, that's one of the things we're trying to uh, work on right now, um, more immediately. And then, if you want to hear more, I have another one. But you give have a it question. to us. Give it to us. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that so that's. Um, the complexity science stuff, I think is super exciting. And related to that, I'm actually helping lead an international data sharing consortium uh, for psychedelic neuroimaging. So me and a guy named Daniel Stock at McGill University, who's on my PhD committee, and then a researcher called Emmanuel Stematicus at Cambridge in the UK. Us three are leading a uh, consortium where we've assembled basically every psychedelic brain imaging lab in the world, uh, spanning the U.S., um, Brazil, uh, Denmark, uh, like Zurich, Basel, um, 
and probably other places I'm forgetting, and, and the UK, of course. And uh, you know, we're all sharing our data together to analyze it as a whole in the meta-analysis to really find what is consistent in the literature. And so for that complexity project, we're going to be using that data set as the plan. And this is like, I think, huge for, again, trying to understand the apparent inconsistencies and trying to find where they all come together. And so that's also something that, um, that we've got in the works, which is exciting. That is exciting. And yeah, totally. Very cool. I love that that's happening. Um, by the way, listeners, uh, if you like this hardcore neuroscience episode, please let me know. I can bring more of this. I, I am basically just guessing as to what you guys like to listen to. You all really liked ketamine for adolescents. You really, really liked psilocin <laughs> versus psilocybin. I can never predict. So um, if you love hardcore neuroscience, tell me on Instagram or on LinkedIn or wherever you see these posted. Please let me know. We can bring more of this. I appreciate very much you coming on, Manish, and explaining things to us as basically as possible, especially for personally me. Um, mm -hmm. So can you tell us where uh, people can find you and your work? Right, for sure. So um, you kind of mentioned in the intro, which I appreciate. So I do have a psychedelic content creation channel, brand, whatever you want to call it. And so on YouTube, it's The Psychedelic Scientist. I haven't released a video in a while, but I am wrapping that up again soon. And um, also, you can watch out for me on Instagram, uh, the psychedelic scientists again. And uh, in the more short term future, I'm going to be regularly posting, you know, reels and other content on there. So I'll be providing a lot of information. And, and I'm also also um, also always open to requests for things to to share, to break down a study you heard about or a concept or to shed light on myths and misconceptions. So people can DM me on Instagram. Uh, you can also find me on LinkedIn, Manesh Gurn, and you can message me through there. So I, I really, you know, enjoy and I'm passionate about of ed uh, educating people in the space and sharing, you know, uh, rigorous and nuanced descriptions of things but that are uh, at the same time, hopefully understandable by lay people. And because I think there's a lot of a lot of people are trying to get into the psychedelic media space these days. And I think but a lot of them are not scientists. And so a lot of the stuff I see and I kind of cringe at it because it's very simplistic and it sometimes it's based on full on misunderstandings. And then that information propagates because people don't know any better. And so, yeah, with my uh, stuff, I'm really trying to rectify that. And and like, yeah, being on this podcast is a big part of that, too. So thanks so much for having me. Uh, it was completely our honor. I'm very stoked that, that we got to make this happen. Um, well, like I said, the ver the virtual podcast door is open. Anytime you have new research, please come tell us about it. And awesome. until then, yeah, for everybody else out there, until next time. Thanks so much for listening to the Psychedelic Medicine Podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard, please leave a rating or review as it helps others find the show. And if you'd like to learn more, you can find the show notes at plantmedicine.org forward slash podcast. And there's information for clinicians at psychedelicmedicineassociation.org. Our incredible music was by the one and only Porangi. We'll see you next time.